Hey. Hey everyone, welcome back. Got my coffee here today, trying something new called chocolate oat milk. And if I'm being honest, I'd have to say it's probably the best thing I've had in my entire life. Today we'll be talking about some Bayesian dark magic. And this comes with the story a little bit. So I was reading over some code written by somebody else a couple of months ago. And the code was written to do something relatively simple. It was just trying to take the average value across 10 groups. And there were five samples within each group. And so what I would have assumed the code would be doing is something very simple. Just looking at the five observations in the first group, taking the average, taking the five observations in the next group, taking that average and so on. So you end up with 10 averages and each average is made up of five observations each. Now I dug into the code a little bit and it was doing something a little bit more complicated and more specifically, it seemed like when it was taking the average of the first group, we can just call it group A, it was taking into account not only those five observations in group A, but also for some reason taking into account information for all the other groups. I initially thought this must have been a bug, but when I asked the author of the code, I realized that it was not a bug at all. In fact, it was actually an implementation of a very smart and elegant method in stats called partial pooling. So let's do a concrete example, and this will be the same exact example that's referenced in a blog post below which helped me understand this concept a lot better. So let's say you are a coffee researcher. So you lead a team of coffee researchers and your goal is to figure out the average temperature of a coffee at various cafes in your city. So let's say there's 10 cafes in your city and in ideal circumstances, you would be ordering hundreds to thousands of coffees at each cafe to get a very large sample size, but you have a limited budget for this experiment. So you can only afford to order five coffees at each of these 10 cafes. So this is the same exact setup as I was talking about in the beginning where we have 10 groups and five observations available per group. So we don't have a massive sample size here is one of the first things you'll notice. Overall, we have 50 things, 50 observations or coffees, but more importantly, we only have five observations per group or per cafe. So let's say you take a day and you send out all your coffee minions to the various coffee shops and they collect the five coffees at each shop and take the temperatures and come back to you with the data at the end of the day. Now, the big question is how do we analyze this data? Now, the most straightforward approach and what I thought was pretty much the only approach for a long time is that, well, we have 50 observations. We have five coffees within each of these 10 coffee shops. Let's just take the arithmetic average of each of these. Maybe we can report standard deviations if we want. And we're done. We can just rank those and say, this has the hottest coffee on average. This cafe has the coldest coffee on average. All done. Now, let's revisit the small sample size issue and think about where things might go wrong. As we said before, five coffees is not a massive sample size. So let's say at one of the coffee shops, you get an outlier. So a coffee that's too hot or too cold. In other words, a coffee that's not representative of the true average temperature of the coffees at that cafe. Now, because you only have five samples, that outlier is going to have a pretty big influence. It's going to pull the mean either really far down or really far up. And since we've done nothing to correct for that, we're going to possibly get some skew, some bias in the data where things aren't ranked the way they really should be. And these outliers might be having more influence than we would ideally like them to have. So let's say another researcher on your team has a different idea. They say, well, well it seems like we have a small sample size issue looking at these coffee shops individually. What if instead we just pool all of the data, so all 50 of these measurements into one large group and we just report the average there? Now, this seems like a bad idea at first, of course. Um, we'll get to that, but let's talk about the good idea, the good part of this idea first. And that is, of course, we address this low sample size issue. We have 50 samples now, which isn't massive, but it is 10 times bigger. It is tenfold bigger than the sample sizes we were dealing with for the individual coffee shops which means that when we report this average across all 50 coffees, we can have a lot more confidence in that average. We know that it's affected less by outliers. And now, of course, the obvious downside here is that we're not exactly tackling the task at hand. We wanted average measurements for each coffee shop, not one grand pooled average across all coffee shops. So on one hand, it seems like if we go about this, the naive individual approach, uh, unpooled is the proper word here, then we will get estimates per coffee shop, but those estimates could be very skewed due to low sample size. 
On the other hand, if we pool everything together, we address this low sample size issue, but we no longer get individual estimates per coffee shop. So is there a way to get the best of both worlds? Can we combine the pooled and unpooled variations of this analysis into something in the middle? And as the name of this video might suggest, yes, we can. And that is this elegant method called partial pooling. And the intuition behind partial pooling is this. And it seems like a weird, wrong idea at first. And so I'll try to convince you that actually it is a good idea because I had to convince myself of the same thing. Uh, but first, the idea is this. When you're taking the average temperature of all the coffees in, let's say, coffee shop A, you would use not only those five coffees you actually got from coffee shop A, but you would also include information about coffee temperatures from all the other coffee shops. And so in terms of implementation, the easiest way to go about this would just be some kind of weighted linear combination of the average from just those five coffees in coffee shop A and the average of all of the coffees, all 50 coffees together. And the weight you would put on each of these terms, so the average of just the group A and the average overall, the relative weights you would put on these depend on the sample size of each individual group. AKA, if each individual group has a very small number of samples, as in our case, then you would lean more into the pooled average. You would take more of the pooled average into account when reporting the individual average for coffee shop A. On the other hand, if each of your groups have sufficient sample size, so if you're living in a world where you have a lot of budget for this experiment and you got hundreds of coffees from each shop, then you don't need to lean, you don't need to borrow so much information from the pooled average because you have a lot more confidence in your unpooled averages to begin with. And so your estimates of average end up being pretty much just the unpooled versions with maybe a little bit of borrowing information from the overall group. That's more of the implementation, but I don't think I've done a good job of explaining why this is a good idea. What are we trying to achieve yet? So let's talk about intuition instead for the bulk of this video. What are we doing and what are ways we can explain this? So the best way to explain this, I, I think this is the way I finally understood it. So let's say in coffee shop A, we have one coffee out of those five samples that's abnormally cold. Now, we're suspicious that this is an outlier. It's not representative of the true average of the temperatures there. And the way partial pooling helps us deal with that is it says that, okay, this might be an outlier, but I'm going to address that by incorporating information about the entire set of coffees. because there's a lot less likely to see an outlier issue when you look at the entire set because of the larger sample size there. Another way of thinking about it, I have to put my coffee down, I need both hands for this, but when you take the average of two numbers, you are in one sense pulling them towards each other. It's kind of like a gravitational pull. So you have one number here, you have one number here, you take their average and that's something in the middle, which you can think of as those two numbers kind of gravitating closer to each other. And so what we're doing by taking the average of all temperatures in group A, which may be skewed, might have an outlier, be kind of far out here, and the average overall, which is a lot less likely to be skewed, a lot more likely to be representative of the true average, we are pulling this group A average towards that gravitational center. And in statistical terms, we call this regularization, often. You might be thinking of L1 or L2 lasso or ridge regularization. It's not necessary for to understand those things for this video, but it's the same idea, where we don't believe that our parameters or our estimates can be so extreme. And so we regularize them, aka we pull them towards some number. And in the regularization uh, framework, that's usually zero. In this framework, it's the average across all of the coffees because we don't think that number, that pooled average, is so susceptible to this outlier issue. And therefore, we're comfortable letting that pooled average be the gravitational center towards which all of these individual averages are pulled a little bit. And crucially, as we hinted at before, the magnitude of this pull is dependent on the sample sizes at each individual cafe. In our case, we only have five samples per cafe, so we should be more comfortable pulling it a little bit more strongly because outliers are more likely to be an issue. If we had 100 coffees from each cafe, the pull will be a lot weaker. It might be pulled a little bit towards that average. And that's really the whole idea behind partial pooling is that we are taking into account information about the individual averages because we care about the individual averages but also borrowing some information, taking some clues from the overall average because that has a bigger sample size and we can trust it more. So partial pooling can be thought of a very clever statistical compromise between wanting individual estimates and trusting larger sample sizes. So we meet somewhere in the middle there, basically. Now, you know this video would not be complete unless we framed this problem of partial pooling in a Bayesian way, 
we love to do that on this channel. So, and there's a very nice interpretation here for this as well. You see the cat? So, the way to think about this problem in a Bayesian point of view is that let's say you are visiting a 11th coffee shop tomorrow. So you've gathered data on all 10 of these coffee shops, five samples at each coffee shop, and tomorrow you're going to a new coffee shop. And your question is, what is the average temperature going to be of a coffee at that new coffee shop? Now, thinking about this in a Bayesian way, we would first say that, well, my assumption of the average temperature without even visiting that would be the pooled average of all 50 coffees that I've seen so far. And so we can think of this pooled average. And so we can think of this pooled average across all 50 coffees as our prior based on previous data. And so with Bayesian stats, that's always an interesting area where a lot of people assume your prior is based on nothing. It's just a normal distribution with whatever mean and standard deviation you want or a beta distribution with whatever parameter that you just came up with. But if you're doing Bayesian stats in a much more applied setting, it's very common to base your prior off of some previous data set, which is exactly what we're doing here. We have our 50 samples that we just collected yesterday. Let's make our prior the average there, the average of those 50 samples. And so before I even walk into this new coffee shop, I say that that is my understanding of what the average temperature should be. And now we get into the frequentist part of it all, or rather the updating of your beliefs in this Bayesian framework, which is to say that I'm going to update my be prior belief, which is the average across all 50 coffee shops, by taking five samples from this new 11th coffee shop that I just visited and shifting my average away from that pooled mean towards that unpooled mean that I just calculated. And so you see the way I explained it there where we're starting from the pooled version and then moving towards the unpooled version as we get more data or evidence in that direction is opposite to the way I explained it before where we're actually regularizing the unpooled version by pulling it towards this gravitational center which we call the pooled version. The truth is both are totally valid and whichever way is more intuitive for you to think about it is fine. In one sense, it's regularizing some data you've seen in the world to some larger body of data you've seen in the world. And the other sense, it's updating some prior belief towards some data that you just observed about the world. They're two sides of the same coin, the same concept really. And so I hope you thought this concept was as cool as I did, this partial pooling concept. It gives you a way to address small sample sizes really elegantly and trade off this wanting individual averages and also having a lot of confidence in those averages together. And so if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this and I'll see you next time.